Now, I told this to Ken so I can tell it to everybody. And the introduction was made by Buddy a moment ago, so if I can be said in public to everybody, then I can say this. Ken came up the other day and told me that he had the best hearing aid he ever, ever had had. And I said, what kind is it? He said, 1015. <laughs> Explain that to Nancy. Uh, well, <clears throat> wait till after she gets home. <laughs> anyway, ye that hath ears to hear, <laughs> Let him hear what the Spirit saith through the infallible Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6, 17. I want to mention we ought, I don't know whether we think about this enough, but we ought to be thankful for one another in brothers and sisters in Christ. We ought to have no better friends than those who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we ought to count them for all the Bible says that they actually are from God's perspective. Even with all of our moles and bumps and whatever else that we have, as long as we're all striving for the truth of the gospel and each one helping the other to know that truth and to practice it. The question that I'm going to raise today is anchored in Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 12 through 20. Who will be spared from judgment? Now at the time of the writing and the work of the great prophet Ezekiel, Jerusalem was in the darkest of days and not long to last, which meant the whole southern tribe of Judah or kingdom at this time was going to be gone. And yet there were still those hypocrites and hard-hearted people who had for years resisted the truth of God under the law, who were thinking, oh, God will never let anything happen to Jerusalem because there's where the temple is. And look what great people we've had in our past. Look what wonderful people they've been. Look how faithful they've been. The prophet Ezekiel is already over in the captivity. Remember, the captivity took place in three different times so while Jeremiah does his work in Jerusalem, Ezekiel's already in the captivity, and he's telling those people there, you're here for a long time, so you might as well build your houses and plant your gardens and plan on living here. But they were saying, oh, no, no, we'll go back. Now, this is the background of verses 12 through 20 of Ezekiel chapter 14. The prophet said, the word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, for the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously. Then will I stretch our, out mine hand upon it, and will break the staff of the bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. If I cause noisome beasts to pass through the land, and they spoil it, so that it may be desolate, that no man may pass through because of the beast, though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters. They only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. Or if I bring a sword upon the land and say, Sword, go through the land, so that I cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, but they only shall be delivered themselves. Or if I send a pestilence into the land, and pour out my fury upon it in blood, to cut off from it man and beast, Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, 
They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Of course, as I said, Ezekiel is describing judgment against the southern kingdom of Judah because of their long-term sins. Now, he mentions three great champions. One of them, Daniel, is still living. Champions of the faith. Champions of great service to God. And that they would be saved by their righteous conduct. The men, Noah, Daniel, and Job. Their country was exceedingly and of a long time wicked. And they had been rebellious against the prophets. But there is a message in the scripture that does give us hope. Paul's here to say again, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Romans 15 verse 4. Indeed, we can be saved from our sins. Remain faithful to God and the Lord's church. And go to heaven when the world ends. And we'll do it under the New Testament Christian dispensation. Just like these three men did in the time they lived on this earth in their relationship to God. The three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job. Because they were great and good and loyal to God as His Word directed, many of the Jews are saying, oh no, we, we have these kind of people among us. It's sort of like the old saying goes, we can ride in on their own coattail. But how many times in our passage did God say, none of what they did in faithful service to me is going to help anybody else but themselves? Yes, they are exemplary in their faithful service to God, but you've got to follow their example, doing what they did, believing what they believed. So as these things are written aforetime for our learning, then let's study the chief characteristics of these men for the express purpose of helping us live as they lived in relationship to God. For indeed, they are godly patterns for us to look to. First of all, I want us to notice Noah. What an example or pattern of obedience is Noah to us. At a time when mankind was corrupt, his mind was only on evil continually. The scripture tells us, Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 8, that Noah found favor or grace in the eyes of the Lord. You will notice that though Noah is saved by God's favor, that is his grace, it does not rule out Noah exercising his faith which faith was based upon what God told him to do in God's Word. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. So God offered Noah the chance to be saved. But now here is the rub. He had to do the things in God's way. Genesis 6, 9, and 18. And the Hebrews writer seeking to strengthen Christians in Hebrews 11 and 7 pointed out that he acted by faith. Notice faith acts. James says in James 2 that a dead faith is one basically it says, yes, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, but you don't have to do anything in order to be saved. That's a dead faith. To merely assent to the fact of the existence of God, the deity of Christ, the Bible being the Word of God, or anything else that it says, is insufficient. The devil does that. The faith that Noah had was a faith that came strictly through the instructions God gave him. And Genesis 6 and verse 22 says, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. And thus we see there are works that are works of obedience that show our faith to God. I have yet to understand, though I've said it many years, if I were to stand here and say I have great faith in God, 
And I'm going to show you my trust, faith, belief in God, but I'm not going to obey His commandments. I'd like to know how I can show you my faith in God and godly things. It would be an impossibility. Noah did all of this preparing for something that had never happened. It had never been. And that's the kind of faith we need. A faith built upon evidence. God exists. Jesus Christ is deity. The Bible is infallible, inerrant, all-sufficient, final and complete revelation of God to man. Now, those, of course, are assertions. They have to be proven, but I assure you they can be. And once they have been proven, then the Bible itself becomes a proof text to find out what God would have me to do and all other men to do to be saved from their sins and to remain faithful to God. And, and Noah stands as a shining example of having faith in God based on His Word in something he had never seen and it had never happened. He obeyed God, Hebrews 11, 7. And he did it when he followed God's pattern. As I said, doing all that God commanded him. Serving God will not always be easy. God never said that it would. Jesus plainly taught, take up your cross daily and follow me. Why is it that we have to be reminded time and time again that there is a cross to bear? We sing songs about it. We know the Bible speaks of the terrible, torturous, heinous, shameful, terrible death of Jesus Christ. And yet we seem to be surprised because we're called on at times in being faithful to Him and obeying His will to hurt because we did it. We have been influenced too much that when you become a Christian, you're in a bed of roses. No, that's just beginning. We're in the trying time. Our faith must be put to the test for it to grow. Serving God will not always be easy. It won't even be popular or seem the thing to do. For there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. But as Noah did, we must obey anyway. Then we have Daniel. Daniel, an example of conviction. As a young man, Daniel found himself far from home. He was about 18, best we can figure out, when he was carried away in captivity. He would have been of the aristocrats of his time. He was far away from home in a very strange land as far as customs and language and so forth. Daniel 1. 3 through 4 and verse 6. He would not violate the law of what they were to eat when it came to the orders from the king that they be fed the best as the Babylonians saw it that they could have. Daniel 1 and verse 8. Because to accept it and partake of it would be to violate the law. And yet he would be going against the very thing the law of the land said he ought to do. He had faith that God would take care of him if he did what God told him. Daniel 1, 12 through 13. Do you see why now God, through the prophet Ezekiel back there in Jerusalem, tells them no matter how righteous these people were, they can only deliver themselves by their own faithful life, their own convictions built upon the truth. Daniel refused to conform to his surroundings and violations of God's law. And we're taught the same thing today. What an example for us. And you'll remember that later on, Daniel refused to obey an ungodly law, Daniel 6, 6 through 13, for the simple reason that God's laws always overrule man's laws when man's laws stand in contradistinction and in contradiction to God's laws. Acts 5, verse 29. We ought to obey God rather than men. Now, you know, God says that, and He doesn't say, now, when you do this, you're going to suffer and be put in jail, you're going to be beaten. He, he just says, if you want to get from where you are as a sinner and saved by my grace through the gospel, which is my power to save you, 
You must take me at my word and you must will to keep it even though all these things do happen on the road to heaven. There's just one way to save mankind. There's not any other ways. There's one way. And that way involves one having great conviction built upon the truth of God. And we must recognize that fact. Daniel continued to serve God as he always had, regardless of what people thought about him, regardless of man's opinion. The late Brother Bill Jackson used to talk about being stubborn with the truth. Have you ever noticed how people seem to think there's no problem being stubborn with error? Uh, people will fight you to be able to continue to sin. Look at our nation. All this stuff that's going on is being stubborn with evil. But if you're stubborn for God's truth, you become some sort of outcast. Hey, they'll nail you to a cross. <laughs> even though you never sinned, and even though you never did anything but good, and came into this world to save sinners. Serving God may lead to undesirable situations. But, like Daniel, again we must have the conviction, but we must have the courage of our convictions to obey God anyway, or let come what may. Then we notice also Job. Now I remind you again, Notice how many times these three men were used because of their dedication to God and their love of God. And used by a prophet even while one of these men was still alive and serving God. Saying to these folks, do not look to them and say that they'll save you because they cannot by their faithfulness save you in your wickedness and unrepentant mind. Job is an example of patience. Now, we use the word patience today in a considerably different way in our modern English than they did when this was written. Patience meant to bear up under a burden, but never stop doing the truth, even when that doing of truth put that burden on you. An example of that is after the death of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, and the great persecution that rose against the church after that. And there was such persecution that all the Christians but the apostles fled Jerusalem. And the interesting thing and the encouraging thing and the example for us is that as they went, the very thing that caused the persecution, they continued to do. They went everywhere preaching the word. We need that kind of patience. Job, it is said of him, was blameless, upright. He feared God. He eschewed, which means he turned away from evil. Job 1.1 1, 1. God had richly blessed him. Called him the greatest man of all the men of the east in Job 1 and verse 3. It's God who calls Satan's attention to Job for his godliness. But Satan, being a liar, the originator of lies, said, yes, but he only does that because you bless him, not because you're God. And we see that he was permitted to test Job's faith, Job 1, 6 through 12. I don't mind telling you, knowing that all of us in the body of Christ, individual Christians, will have our faith tested. And I often think, is God uh, saying, have you considered my servant David Brown? Because I know what's fixed to follow if he does. And it's not going to be easy on me. Not that I measure up to Job where he was in his service to God then. But uh, by the way, he's not going to leave you out either. If you're faithful to him, for your faith in him according to his word to become stronger, he's going to allow Satan at you. That's what Satan does. That's how God uses him. To the one who will hold to the truth, let come what may. Satan just simply is a tool of God to make your faith stronger. It's exactly what happens. 
You remember, Satan thought that he had won the battle with the crucifixion and death of Christ. All he did was work in a way as to bring about the very way man would be saved from his sins. Job lost everything, Job 1, 13 through 19. But he bore up. He was patient. He endured all of it. And that's what patience really means is endure. You see, hurt coming to me because I love the truth, know the truth, and live it doesn't change the truth. We, uh, I'm afraid in America, we're too much in the way of weakening. We're, we're just weak. Even in the church. The first little thing rattles us. And we go home wringing our hands. And oh, woe is me. I'm an American. We have all these freedoms. What's happened? Nothing that hasn't happened in the world before. And then we go along our individual lives and various things hit us. We're not responsible for it. Some we are, some we aren't. But it comes upon us. Do you know why that happens? Because you're a human being in a world dominated by evil. That's the reason it happened to me, to you, to everybody else. And it won't make any difference what you do or how you do it. You're going to die and face the judgment. Satan was then allowed the second time concerning Job to afflict Job's health. Job 2, 1 through 6. Now, I wish you would go back and read the details of the sad state that man's physical health was in. Most of us in America would have, why, I don't know what kind of doctors we would have gone to or else we would have uh, rejected all the doctors and started eating grass or whatever it is people do. Uh, and then die anyway. <laughs> you know, the Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die. But here's where the emphasis is. And after what? After this, the what? The judgment. We do not put the emphasis where God put it. We put it on dying physically. Ah! It better be, and then the judgment. That's where we better be go, whoa, because that's where it's going to happen. And we're right now in the place to make sure that we're spared from the sentencing that will take place for most people that are accountable to God, for all people who are accountable to God that's ever lived. Very few will miss that. Because that's what judgment means, is sentencing according to the way you lived on this earth. So he serves as an example. Well, guess what? James, for inspiration, used Job and said, remember the patience of Job. Remember how Job endured I can see people who could hardly ever get to church. Oh, they're great Christians. They would fight you to say they weren't a Christian. But today they're kind of grunting a little bit. So they, they can't make it to worship. I mean, after all, you know, we meet for worship all day long every day. It becomes a trying thing. And then they get to the judgment and they start offering you excuses. And then maybe one of them turns and there's Job looking at him. You had a problem in life, didn't you? Don't you know these fellows are examples to us to say, Really, folks? You have a hard time? Go explain it to Job. And go explain it to Daniel. And go explain it to Noah. Every one of these written in your Bible to give us the strength we need to love the truth and be godly people in the church. In the end, God blessed Job even greater than he had before. Job 42, verses 10 through 17. Job had no assurance of what was going to happen to him when he was going through all this mess. Yet he remained faithful through all his sufferings. We may have our wives or our husbands discouraging us we may lose our possessions we may lose our health we may lose our family oh by the way you will lose your possessions you will lose your health you will leave your family there will be discouragements you will have accusing so-called friends it's not 
It's not that you, you may or could. You, you will. Now, to what extreme it will be, I don't know. But I know you're going to die. And you're going to say goodbye to everything you know right now. I called Ken the other day and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm having to deal with taxes. I said, good. He said, no, it wasn't good. I said, yeah, it is. You die, go to heaven. That's gone. Now, that's a point, but that's true of everything. Think about the things that have nothing to do with being righteous. But just have to do with being in the flesh in a wicked world and having to live and do the things that are necessary to function in this physical material world. None of that's going to be around. None of it. It's all gone. That ought to encourage us to keep on keeping on. So what are we going to say about these three examples God in the long ago used to impact unfaithful brethren? Well, we should use them today in the same way Ezekiel used them. To remind us God has let some things happen to some people way to the extreme because of their faith. Just to show all the rest of us what some men can do through loving, faithful obedience to the truth to let come what may. The privations and the sacrifices and the physical Hurt as well as the mental hurt some people have gone through, but they would not quit their obedience to God. When you read Ezekiel 14, 12 through 20, and verses like this in the Scriptures, what do they do for you? What do they say to you about what God expects of you? Surely they encourage us. They exhort us, and yes, very well could rebuke us. But they're there to save my soul from death. They're there so that I will be spared at the judgment. Because I die in faith. I will be able to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of of thy Lord. That's what Noah, Daniel, and Job will hear at the judgment. And they're selected here in the Old Testament. Before the church ever is started, before Christ ever came, before there ever was a New Testament, to strengthen us who are members of the precious blood-bought body of Christ. What a privilege it is to be a Christian. A Christian, one who is of Christ, in the great family of God. Why will we reject the truth of God to hold on to things that cannot stand the judgment? Now, we're all going to die. We're all going to face the judgment. What will we hear when we stand before the judgment bar of Christ? It's all dependent on our developing our characters like these men did. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, what better time than now? That's all you have to become a Christian. Lay aside all the things that hindered you from doing what you know the Bible teaches. To believe with all of your heart, based upon the Word of God, the Gospel of Christ, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. To repent of your sins, Acts 17.30. Confess your faith in Him and be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. Galatians 3, 26 and 27 and Acts 2, verse 38. To live in the church to which the Lord will add you, faithful to Him, using such men as this as your examples to persevere, to bear up under the burdens that come to all those who seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, all those who love the truth. For all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If as a child of God, do you remember this morning's sermon on the second law of pardon? Repent of your sins if you need to. Confess your sins. And pray God for forgiveness. God's done everything heaven can do to save us. But as free moral agents, we must now make the choice. And if we've grown weak as Christians, bolster ourselves up. Renew the love of God in our lives. And do the right thing. And that right thing is what God's Word teaches. If you're subject to the invitation of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.